This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. Greetings, everybody, and thanks so much for joining me for another installment of the show because this one features a chat with guitarist Johan Soderberg, and he is in Amon Amath. The catalyst for the chat with Johan is due to the launch of a new album from the group. It is titled The Great Heathen Army, and on that note, if you're listening via the podcast apps, I'm going to share a tune from the album. Is called Get In The Ring. And once it's done, we'll dive into the chat. You people on YouTube, you know the drill. We don't play music on YouTube because we can't. So we're going to listen to the chat right now. Let's go.
How's things been going? How have the interviews been treating you? It's been good. I had a problem because I tried to join the meeting on Zoom on the phone first and it didn't work for some reason. Then I turned on the computer. Ah, okay. I've I've had a, that feedback occasionally, actually. There must be a glitch with the Zoom app. It's probably a glitch, glitch with my phone, man. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Uh, I, look, just in the interest of time, I'll get stuck into things then because uh, I'm enjoying this album, but I've enjoyed your work now for a long time. I love seeing you guys on stage at Download as well in oh, Melbourne in 2018. You guys are one of the standout performers, it must be said, but uh, this album, the new album, The Great Heathen Army, you've rewarded fans by not deviating from what the group does best, which is mid-paced death metal paired with Viking themes and your killer lead breaks and solos. But do you see, do you feel a sense of relief after all of the COVID bullshit and all the rest of it? Is it more a sense of release, relief than accomplishment that is finally out there now? Yeah, definitely a release that is COVID bullshit is... I don't, I don't dare to say that it's over, you know, but yeah. hopefully it's over. Yeah, because we're now we're getting ready to get back on the roads. And I don't want any, anything to fuck with that because we've been sitting, you know, not being able to play a show in two and a half years. So that's been pretty bad. It must yeah, but have been super nice that the, that the album is out finally. Yeah. Were you able to play shows within Sweden? Because Sweden wasn't locked down like Australia and parts of the United States. Yeah, yeah. Sweden was pretty open except for live shows, you know. (laughs) That's the only thing they shut down. They even had had football matches, but they they still did not allow concerts. Yeah, it was very irrational, the response globally, it must be said. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I heard about you guys... uh, and in Australia, that was fucking insane. The way they were, uh, it's disgusting you know. is the best way to describe it. It was appalling yeah. the way that governments, but the biggest issue, Johan, was the way in which fucking idiots went along with it, especially down in Melbourne. The, all these lefty idiots decided that they mm-hmm. wanted to jump on this bandwagon because they enjoy seeing people in states of subservience. That's what it comes down to. All right. I'm sorry yeah. about that. Uh, unfortunately, it is the way of the world. We've we've had it too good for too long, mate. I think is hard, part of the issue. But I digress. Your uh, your twelfth album now. Can you believe it? It's it's twelve albums. And at this point, though, you you've veterans, and I say that in the best possible way. It's not that you're old, but you've been doing it now for so long. You've earned their right to be called veterans. But do you still feel enthused at the prospect of an album launch, or or are albums are they just part of the routine at the moment? No, it's super exciting to release a new album, I think, still. And the same goes with playing live. I still enjoy a lot to go on stage, you know. That's uh, the best thing I know, uh, the most fun thing I know. Much. Do you get Do you get involved in in choosing new merch lines and even the way that you guys are now on the front cover of the album, a bit like Destroyer, <laughs> if I can draw that comparison? Kisses Destroyer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was kind of a, a thing that we were thinking about. Like, oh, let's make, let's put the whole band on the cover and and kind of like destroy it exactly. Yeah, it was like we thought it was fun because usually we just have this whole, you know, one big Viking guy or you know, so usually that's the cover. But now we just want to try to have the band in kind of destroy way. Yeah, looks good. Looks great. You look yeah, amazing. I thought it came out pretty cool, but I, I read some. The responses has, have not been all positive about the cover, actually. Yeah. yeah. What are they saying? What's the what are the what's the negative feedback you're receiving? Uh, the most is just people think some people think it's ugly, you know, plain plain and simple. But well, I mean, I've seen good good comments too. Yeah, well, we we are happy with it. We are in the band. We think it came out cool. Yeah, well, the, the haters can go and form their own bands and make their own album covers. Then that's always my response in those situations. Yeah. You know, what what about with guitar playing? 
It's it sound your guitar playing. You've always been deep in the pocket. You're almost like a bassist in some ways. Did you did you try anything different on this album though? Mm, I don't know what you mean about bassist now. Well, I'm a musician, if you can't tell behind me here, but when I say bassist, you've always been deep in the pocket in that you can groove. And that's a really oh, exciting yeah, yeah. thing when it comes to death metal. That's, sorry, that's what I mean when I say bassist. It's about the groove, and you've always had a very soft oh, right. groove. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We like to have a good groove and, uh, you know, cool riffs. Riffs, that's what we are most about, cool riffs. You know? And then... And, um, really good melodies on top of that yeah but we're not really you know we're not guitar virtuosos that like to play super technical solos and stuff we, we're more like strong melodies and cool riffs you know that's the model of the band i would say mm. yeah yeah did you do anything especially unique on on the album this time around so for example were there any scales that you decided to dive into and and put them into songs that you hadn't done before or any techniques that you use that were new oh maybe, maybe not new techniques but one song for example like the title song the great hidden army has a really different kind of groove i i think mm. it's more like a traditional heavy metal Kind of style on the on the verses there. Yeah, yeah. And did you use did you use real amps this time, or were you were you going for a, the modeling? You know, the on the the apps and the software as opposed to amps. No, we actually used real amps this time. Sometimes we we make up amps and uh, profile them with a camper. But this album we had, Andy Sneak, he has so much, he has a setup where he can mic up lots of amps and then he has some kind of switch. So he can choose, you know, this amp and that amp and he just press a bu button and he switches between different amps. So we had mm. maybe four or five different amps that, that switched between. Yeah. Working with Andy, were, were there, was it one of those situations where you'd be working away for hours and then occasionally you'd drop some Judas Priest, Judas Priest stories? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> he he dropped some Judas Priest stories. And also he plays some, you know, if, if, I, if there's something with the guitar, you know, some mm. string is off or whatever, he wants to check the guitar. He instantly starts to play Judas Priest riffs. That's pretty cool. <laughs> A bit, yeah, yeah. Were there any issues when you were recording that caused any disagreement amongst the band members, especially when you were writing and putting things to tape, so to speak? No, I think it went exceptionally smooth this time. I mean, the songs are pretty much finished before we go to the studio. Usually it's me and Alavi, we make the songs in our home studios and then we show that to the other guys and then BJ uh, Johan Hegg, he makes the lyrics mm -hmm. and then we, we rented a cabin up in the mountains in Sweden mm. so we went up there to record Lovely. Yeah. vocals on, on the demos for like a week and then when the demos are finished then we send it to Andy you know, and he, he gets to say if he thinks something is out of place or you know maybe you should ditch this uh, section here or stuff like that yeah yeah gotcha yeah and then he he, he he takes care of the sound mostly we don't change that much on the songs in the studio mm -hmm. and and the album i think this is the second album that your drummer your new drummer in inverted commas is it sorry for my australian australianisms coming across here but jock or yok uh walgren that he's been yeah, in a band for <laughs> yeah, yeah shocker, shocker, yeah. Mate. <laughs> <laughs> so uh did, what did he contribute that perhaps that perhaps wasn't there when your former drummer was in the band uh, he's a super technical drummer and he's so you know consistent and he you know the hits 
are all the same. The kicks are fucking, if you look at it, the waveform when he plays double kicks is like, it looks fucking, it's perfect, you know. Mm. So that makes it real easy to play with him and uh, he does really, you know, technical fills and stuff. So yeah. usually me and Lola, we make like basic beats when we write the songs and then we send the demo to Yuki and then he kind of programs them on the demo like we want it to be played and then when we come to the studio he has, you know, I think he played all the songs in less than five days, I think. Wow. Yeah, incredible. Bit of a bit of a human metronome there, a bit like Gene Hoglund from yeah, the sounds yeah. of things. Yeah. Yeah, he's super accurate and consistent. Yeah, it's really nice. I better make this my last question so they can get to the next one, mate. But uh, Metal Blade. Are you, are you guys just on a handshake with Brian at this point? Because apart from King Diamond, I can't name another band that's been with him as long. Yeah, that's 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 why we're we're staying with them. They're they're just become good friends, you know, over all the years. So feels we 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 don't see any. Why should we leave them? You know, it's, it work, Everything works fine and. It's a good relationship. Yeah. Yeah, do they get involved at any level or do you just hand everything over to them and they handle the business from there? Yeah, I mean, they don't tell us anything about, about what, what they want in the music and, and in, in, in any way. It's yeah, just, yeah. you know, oh, we're going to make an album. <laughs> and then we, we deliver the, the, the finished product pretty much. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'll make this my last question for you. What are your memories of playing in Melbourne at, at Download in 2018? Yeah, I, that, I really enjoyed that the little festival because uh, we, had, we had the, the Viking ship yes. flown over, or if it was shipped over, <laughs> it was like, it, <laughs> but it was really cool that we actually sent the Viking ship to Australia. Nice, yeah. Did you have to? Did you have to share a dressing room with Fred Durst? <laughs> I don't remember. Was he there? I don't remember him being there. Yeah, I remember Biscuit it was us. There, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, I, I didn't see him, but I remember Mastodon was there, and uh, yeah, what other bands? Gojira, Gojira, and Sabaton. Oh yeah, yeah. Was, it was yeah, it was Sabaton there too? Yeah. Yeah, I remember they had really cool flipper pinball machines backstage as well. <laughs> <laughs> they put on a spread. Hopefully they put out some nice beer as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, some good stuff there. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for the chat, mate. Congratulations on the album. But beyond that, just being able to forge such a, a an epic career. You're the... You're globally famous, you're well known, and fans love you and adore you. So long may you continue to reign. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Have a great one. You too. Well, there you go. That was a conversation with Johan Soderberg, who is the guitarist in the group. Amon Amarth, thanks very much to him for the chat there. Over a little too quickly, though, wasn't it? Never get enough time with these blokes. I'd like to dive into many other aspects of their career, but... You only get allocated about 15 to 20 minutes or so, and with the issues with Zoom there, it was a little bit shorter than that. Anywho, never mind. If you like that chat, you might like to listen to more, and you can do that over at scarsandguitars.com. And if you like listening to the show, maybe you'd want to read the book as well. Scars and Guitars, Volume 1, it is now available Stick around and have a listen to a bit of a promo for the book. I'm sure you'll be enticed. If you do go to the website, click the link in the banner, you can download a sample from a marketplace of your choice. And if you do complete the purchase, let me know via socials or send me an email via the website because I want to thank you personally. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast. As I say, stick around because I've got more to tell you about the book. But for right now, 
Till next time, it is a very good bye. Catch ya. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Super Joint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, Playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, I, just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldina. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was, he was very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book. <laughs>